Good morning, America. Good morning, Europe. Good evening, Asia. I'm E. Che, a professor of material science and engineering at Stanford and SLAC National Lab. On behalf of my co-chair, Professor William Che, I proudly announce the launch of Storage X International Symposium. This is a weekly online event. We all know COVID-19 has changed the way how we interact as scientists. We hope this uh, Storage X Symposium can bring scientists around the world together to present, discuss results and ideas on, on energy storage, and offer a platform for academia and industry to interact, for students to learn. This Storage X Symposium is supported by Stanford Storage X Initiative and also supported by Stanford Precore Institute for Energy. Uh, this planning of symposium is not possible without the strong support of many staff, Jimmy Chen, Tracy Turner, our graduate student, William Huang, and also uh, our IT support, Justin Warren and Sarah Weaver. To kick off today's launching of the event, I'm very proud to have two leading scientists today to give two seminars on the topic of energy storage. The first speaker uh, require very little introduction, as well as the second speaker, uh, we have Professor Stan Wittingham from Binghamton University and Professor Jun Liu from PNNL National Lab and Washington University. Stan, of course, everybody know, um, he is a pioneer of uh, lithium ion batteries and intercalation chemistry. To recognize his contribution, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2019 for his contribution really starting the whole field of uh, lithium-ion batteries together with John Goodenough and Yoshino. And Jun, of course, we all know as well, and he's a leading scientist in the world, uh, particularly working on materials designed for batteries, especially for the next generation of lithium ion batteries. He's also a director of a Battery 500 Consortium. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Stan to kick off today's symposium. Stan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, what I want to do is really go back almost or 50 years and show you how the lithium battery ideas got started and then show you a couple of challenges um, that are present today. And I'll show you my relationship to a number of institutions on the way. So I went to school in Britain, as most of you can probably hear, at Stanford. I then spent um, seven years, eight years at Oxford for both my bachelor's and doctorate degrees. Then I went to um, sunny California to Stanford for four years, so that's my relationship with Stanford. Then I went to what was then ESSO, now Exxon or ExxonMobil, and I'm now presently at Binghamton. Just in case there's people who don't study the history, um, batteries started out more than two centuries ago by Volta. And if you go to Lake Como, you'll be able to go to see the temple they built in his honor there and some beautiful views of the Alps behind the temple. But the person who really laid the foundation for electrochemistry was Michael Faraday in Britain. And he was around shortly after Volta. So those are the two folks we need to honor for what they did. 
I had um, two great experiences and I want to describe a little bit about both of them. You'll see how this led into lithium ion battery. One was Peter Dickens, my tutor and advisor, at Oxford in New College. And I should emphasize that at that time, Oxford had three chemistry departments, inorganic, physical and organic. And inorganic included metallurgy and crystallography. So material science was really part of inorganic chemistry at that time. And then I came to Stanford and worked with Bob Huggins for four years. And in addition to great science there, that's why I met my wife and our children were both born in that area. So that Stanford was a critical step in my life. So let's just look at um, really the precursors to lithium ion batteries. I looked at compounds called tungsten bronzes. These are multicolored materials whose color depends on the amount of alkali metal and therefore on the amount of the electron concentration and are now used in electrochromic displays. But we found out the ions can move very fast through the lattices and there are at least three different structures I showed two of them here. For my bachelor's degree and at Oxford, you have to spend a year of research for your bachelor's degree. I actually looked at some catalysis reactions on these materials and showed the impact of structure, both electronic and crystalline structures. Then for my doctorate, I actually looked at how these reduced to tungsten metal because in making tungsten filament, you add a little bit of sodium, which is sodium bronze, to the mix. And we showed in all these, all the alkali ions moved extremely fast. Then when I went to Stanford, we actually did a fundamental study of the thermodynamics of formation of these materials. And this was published in an NBS special publication. And we were able to grow single crystals up to a centimeter on the side as cubes and dodecahedrons. What really happened almost exactly the same time is Yao and Kuma at Ford Motor Company discovered the very high ionic conductivity and sodium beta alumina. The sodium ions moved almost as fast as in aqueous solutions. And they at that time proposed a sodium sulfur battery and their publication in 1967 really led to many other searches for high ionically conducting materials. Prior to that time, it's really only thought that silver moved fast in materials. And as a result, John Gooden have started looking at Nasicon. And if you look at the title of this slide, Bob and I created this title. And this was also published by NBS. That's beta alumina prelude to a revolution in solid state electrochemistry. I'm not sure we thought we'd be as right as we were, but the field really blossomed after that time. So let's just look at what beta alumina is for a second. It's a layered structure. It was called beta alumina because it was just thought to be a different form of aluminum oxide. But it was Linus Pauling who worked out the structure and found out that sodium ions were critical to the structure. And I show you the structure on the left here. It's four layers of gamma alumina. Then you have this very open structure with oxygen bridges, and then the sodium or other ions inserted between them. And it's absolutely critical to the ionic conductivity that you have excess sodium. And it turns out this is about 15%. And you can see these excess ions in as dumbbells here and another one over here. Without those, the ionic conductivity is not good at all. So why were we interested in that? Well, we wanted to actually measure how fast the sodium ions moved in beta alumina. They move far too fast for one to use the typical inert platinum electrodes. So we basically had to build a cell where the electrodes were both reversible to sodium ions and to electrons. And the ideal materials were 
these tungsten bronzes or the analogous vanadium materials, which we call metallic mixed conductors. And really this is now, if you like, a, a battery, if you had the different compositions of the bronzes. So I show you here a picture of what we had. We had a sodium beta alumina single crystal. And I should say beta alumina was used as large bricks to line glass tanks. So you could ship out large single crystals up to an inch in length here. Then we put the bronze electrodes on each side. And on the right hand side, you can see the ionic conductivity we measured from um, 800 degrees centigrade down to um, liquid nitrogen temperatures. And you'll notice it's a single mechanism the whole way. And I think it's still probably the one material that has the highest single mechanism of the largest temperature range. So we'd shown we could build a, a system to measure ionic conductivity on moving to Exxon, we started getting interested in battery chemistry, and it may surprise you if to learn if you actually looked at all the publications at that time. They did not understand roller intercalation or that you could have non stoichiometric ternary phases. So it was assumed, in, for example, in V2O5, you abstracted oxygen from the lattice, and the alkaline cell you also abstracted oxygen. So you change the structure at room temperature, which is really not all that realistic. In reality, what happens in these, you are intercalating lithium in the vanadium oxide lattice. And in the case of the alkaline cell, you're intercalating protons into that lattice forming hydroxyl bonds. And we published that in the mid seventies in the Electrochemical Society. And this really led to the whole concept of intercalation chemistry and its role in electrochemistry. And as we know, these ternary phases are extremely common now at room temperature. So it's interesting to go back and look at what intercalation is described as. If you go back and look at a dictionary 30 or 40 years old, it will mention it that February 29th is an example of intercalation. You stick it in the calendar one year, then take it back out. Or as the Romans did, they forgot two months and intercalated January and February into the calendar. If you pick up a present day dictionary, the first example will be a chemical example of intercalating lithium into some material. And as we showed in the 70s, you're not talking just about ions, you can put molecules, um, DNA, large length um, amines in all these materials, they're extremely flexible. And I show you the example of TIS2 schematic there. We go basically from 5.7 angstroms, it expands to 6.2 angstroms. And essentially as you put the lithium in, you're putting lit electrons into the conduction band. So a very simple reaction. And in this case, it's a single phase all the way from zero lithium to one lithium. And this shows you a very old uh, electrochemical cycling system. This was back in 1973, I think. And you'll notice we ran it at about 10 milliamps per square centimeter. And I look back at some of our old patents the loading in some of these cells varied from about 20 or 30 milligrams per square centimeter up to 100 milligrams per square centimeter. We had the big advantage is that titanium disulfide is essentially a metallic conductor, so you don't need any carbon black. So the reaction can occur at all points on the material. And the other thing I pointed out earlier, there's no phase transition here, so there's no nucleation energy. So it cycles very, very readily. The difference between the charge and discharge here is just the IR loss. So if you go back to look at what SO did, they really took the initiative to invest in um, all sorts of 
new energies, solar cells, fuel cells, batteries amongst others, and spent many millions of dollars in this area because they thought it was important. And in this picture, you show me with a slightly, um, I would say old fashions, rather large lapels. And on the right hand side, you'll see what we use. These are single crystals. And I notice single crystals are back in vogue now. So we use single crystals of various shapes, just as Sony eventually used single crystals of lithium cobalt oxide. And this is what um, we built the cells out of. So a little bit of history here, and I'll repeat this in the next slide as well. So in the, it was in the 1970s we worked on titanium disulfide. For safety, we actually used aluminum anode. So we used a lithium aluminum alloy as the anode. Uh, and I show you two cells here, one cell here. This is about six inches by four inches by about an inch thick. This was shown at the EV show in 1977. And it drove a motor cycle headlamp on and off all week long. And then the top right here is a marketing giveaway, a paperweight that has a solar cell in it, a battery, and a little clock. This particular one still sits in my office. It still works. And if you go to the Nobel Museum, you'll see a number of these batteries there that we gave to them, which we fortunately could find last December. So they well made lithium batteries last forever. About um, 10 years later, Molly Energy in British Columbia manufactured many lithium batteries and Jeff Darm was associated with that. Jeff, in fact, did his PhD on titanium disulfide, but they decided to use molybdenum disulfide because molybdenite is a natural ore in British Columbia, so they could just dig it up. A little bit later, John Goodenough at Oxford, having read our TIS2 work, he was working on cobalt oxides for their magnetic behavior, decided to try it as a battery cathode, and you all know what happened after that. It was a great success. Around about the same time, there was a lot of interest in removing the lithium anode, making it safer. And Yoshino, who, who was in a company then, was looking at polyacetylene and some cokes and found he could readily intercalate lithium in and out of those materials. And they eventually worked closely with Sony to commercialize the cells in 1991, using basically a graphitic carbon and single crystals of lithium cobalt oxide. And you'll see on the right hand side, a picture taken two years ago where John and I were together at a Batty 500 consortium meeting, I think in Berkeley. So John and I are still working together to push the frontiers forward. Let's just look at bit schematic in case there's anybody who doesn't know what a intercalation cell is. It, all the batteries, they still use this 1970s technology where we store lithium in two materials with the different and free energies of formation and then just shuttle the lithium between the two sides from the anode here to the cathode to an organic electrolyte. And here are the various different stages from 1972, we started with lithium, went to lithium aluminum, then Yoshino put in carbon, and there's been a lot of interest in, lately in tin or silicon. And now, ideal, we'd like to go back to lithium, and I'm sure John will discuss that a little bit. So that's the anode side and the cathode side. We started with TIS2, then switched to the analogous oxides, which John did at Oxford. And it's it good to point out here, as I did in my um, banquet speech in Stockholm, I did my work as an Englishman in America. John did his work as an American in England. Then from cobalt oxide, you went to the mixed metal oxides. Then John came up with the olivine structures, both the iron compound and now there's interest in the manganese phosphate because of its a higher voltage. And now I'll show you one slide a little bit later. Phosphates are much more stable, and therefore safer. 
but they're too low in energy density for many applications. So the interest is, can we pump two lithium ions into some of these materials? So if we actually look at what we get out of today's batteries, it is not all that impressive. So of today's batteries, we get much less than 30% of their theoretical volumetric or gravimetric capacity. And one of the main culprits here is the carbon anode. It takes up half the volume of the cell and needs 70 grams to store seven grams of lithium. So the ideal will be try to make lithium metal work and maybe an intermediate stage would be to go to silicon. It's not working too well because it's too reactive. And we've been looking at um, tin iron complexes to replace the tin cobalt that Sony worked on a, a while back. Tin iron has about a 99.95% columbic efficiency. So very good, but tin is a little bit heavy and expensive. On the cathode side, we really need to use all the lithium in the materials. So on the layered oxides, we maybe use only two thirds. And on the phosphates, we need to stuff more lithium in there. In addition, we need to make the cathode materials behave more like titanium disulfide. In other words, increase their ionic and their electronic conductivity. This would let us use thicker electrodes, which would reduce the amount of current collector and the separator. So let's just look at one of the issues of these layered oxides. Basically on the first cycle, we leave about 12% of the capacity of the material unused. If we could use that material, we could fairly easily attain over 400 watt hour per kilogram cells and maybe even get to 500. 500 would just be getting to 50% of the theoretical capacity. And I show you here, this is the typical loss. Sometimes it's quite a bit higher than this, but this is independent of rate. It's independent of um, the nickel content. But interestingly, it doesn't show up in lithium cobalt oxide. It doesn't show up in titanium disulfide. And it doesn't show up in the olivines. So we measured the diffusion coefficient of these materials. And you can see. It's fairly high, about 10 to the minus 9 at low lithium contents, then falls off the cliff as we get to high lithium contents. And this is the reason why we can't get all the lithium back in. If we just increase the temperature to 45 degrees centigrade, we can certainly get all that lithium in. So it's clearly a kinetic phenomenon which we need to solve. So the question we asked ourselves is, is it feasible to put two lithium ions into a crystalline lattice without damaging that crystalline lattice? We knew it had been done in vanadium diselenide back in uh, um, Exxon days. And Mike Thackeray had shown you could put it in some of the layered oxides, but at a very low voltage. So we chose to work on a vanadyl phosphate. And obviously, I wouldn't be discussing this un unless it worked. And this was one of only two battery-related activities and the only EFR-related activity that was in the um, White House's technology report of last year. And you can see the two students we highlighted there one from my group and one from Claire Gray's group at Cambridge, who got the award for from DOE for one of the best um, inventions of, of the first 10 years of the EFRCs. So let's look at this material. You'll see that this material, it's very well known material. It is forms at least, I think, seven different phases. This particular phase, which we call the epsilon phase, was discovered by Alan Jacobson, also at Exxon at that time. And we spent many years trying to make this in a form that would 
get good electrochemistry out of it. And we found out we could make it by a hydrothermal approach where we got these nice little cuboids about 100 to 200 nanometers particle sizes. If you get larger particles and have to grind it, you then damage the crystal structure and it doesn't cycle so well. And what is remarkable about this material, if you look at it, here are the first 50 cycles, and the worst one of these cycles is, in fact, the first one, here to here, more polarization. As we cycle it more and more, it gets better and better. So this has about 300 milliamp per hours per gram. Right now, it's really, we've shown, I think, proof of concept. You can put two alkali ions into a crystal lattice without damaging that lattice. There are still challenges here. This material is used as an oxidation catalyst by the petroleum industry. So it tends to react with some of the solvents. So the um, Coulombic efficiency is about 98, 99%. So we have to get that up to 100% and we have to improve the rate capability. But as proof of principle, we can go beyond the single lithium systems. A key thing that happened late last year, basically whilst we were in Stockholm, is that the space station replaced all their nickel metal hydride batteries with lithium ion batteries. And these were the two astronauts at that time who spoke to us and discussed how they replaced the lithium ion batteries and that they now used half the number of batteries they used to use and the batteries would last twice as long. So they were very happy with lithium ion. So lithium ion has made its splash out there in the space station. And I think maybe it's important to point out, it was this lady who was born in Maine, US, of Swedish parents. She and her colleague were the two who went outside the space shuttle to install the batteries in the system. So let me just finish showing you a few examples of where lithium batteries are now dominant. Um, we can clearly clean the environment with electric vehicles. There are a lot of challenges still, and I'll show you a few examples here. Um, this picture in the middle here is a small electric vehicle, one of the first half dozen on Bermuda, where my wife and I rented one for our 50th anniversary last year. And the thing we found out very quickly is range anxiety is real. We were told there are charging stations at the far end of the island, but charge it before you come back. We went to the far end of the island, they were still building the recharging stations. So we stopped partway back, got it recharged, and just managed to creep back. On the right hand side, are uh, two, two large trucks, one a 16-wheeler and the other one a garbage truck, being tested by Peterbilt up north of Seattle. And I should thank John Liu for taking us there. So these large trucks are going all electric, and this particular truck, I understand, is in the Los Angeles docks, taking the large trailer units around there. The other key aspect of, um, of batteries where they can help us is in enabling renewable energy. You know, solar and wind only operate part of the daytime normally, so we have to store the energy from them so we can use it when we want to use it. So this will give us a cleaner, more sustainable technology. And an interesting example here is in Binghamton, Almost 10 years ago now, they installed a small lithium-ion battery system, about four megawatt hours, next to a coal power plant. And within two months, they turned off the coal power plant and it's never come back on again. So we can wipe out small peaker plants by using storage. And storage is clearly critical in mitigating global warming and it'll give us a more efficient grid and clearly as everyone knows it's uh, enabled the communications revolution and at the bottom right i show you here this is the 
British ambassador's residence in Stockholm. And for the Nobel session, she brought over two vehicles from London. The one on the left is an all electric Jaguar, and the one on the right is an all electric London taxi built in collaboration with Volvo in Sweden. And they used the taxi to take them to the palace for the various receptions. So the British were certainly very excited and very interested in going electric. And they're pushing it, particularly in large cities like London. And I expect we're going to find like places like New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, and so on are going to be pushing for all electric in the future. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Stan, for the very, very nice uh, overview of the past history as well as what can be done uh, for the future. And uh, let me report back to you. And there are a lot of uh, people now watching uh, this uh, symposium online. Um, in Zoom right here, we have uh, about 560 people. And then we also have a view on our Storage X website. There are more than, there's about close to 3,000 people right there watching. Um, uh, the audience raised uh, many great questions. I think I can only pick uh, a few to um, you know to ask you due to the time limitation. So the first question, Stan, is about um, high nickel cathode. Uh, there are actually a number of questions uh, right there. I condensed them into one question. Okay. Uh, asking about the prospect of uh, high nickel cathodes. Also asking about this nickel cathode A11, what, how, how fast is the lithiation and delithiation kinetics, as well as they're wondering the safety of high nickel cathode. I'll start from this question. Okay, I think first thing, I think the high nickel gives you a higher energy density, but industry is as much interested in high nickel because it reduces the cobalt content and going from 333 to I think, 622 or 532 has cut the cost of the cathode by about 40%. So there's that huge driving force. To my understanding, auto industry is now using 622. And some people say they're already beginning to use 811. And that's not too different to what Tesla is using with NCA. So the answer is the hazard level does increase as you increase the nickel content. But in some ways, it's still the lithium anode is the most hazardous part of the cell. If you cycle it many times, there's some pulverization of the graphite there. So I think they're fairly safe, but the higher nickel you go, there's more gassing. So you're tending to, think to having to use hard side cells. You can't use pouch cells at very high nickel content. So there are some limitations, but it's gonna be a huge drive to go to high nickel. And clearly, if people could go to high manganese and make that work, that'd be much lower cost. Yeah, very, very good, Stan. Uh, the second question, there's a, a person asking, I also want to ask this question as well. We know for the battery research, going from starting until it's successfully commercialized, it could take a long time. And for your initial you know, invention in the 19... 70s of anno using lithium aluminum, cathode is a titanium sulfide from research starting to make that into commercial product. How long did it take? Well, Exxon was trying to sell commercial products in about, I would say 1978, 1980, the kind of alpha testing. So they sold them in fact to some watch companies Initially, they were going to build electric vehicles, but they decided they better alpha test it in some smaller devices first. And in those days, watches used LEDs, which use much more energy than LCDs. So a primary cell would die out in about a week. So they wanted rechargeable cells. So they used that um, Mali Energy, in fact, built a large manufacturing effort with molybdenum disulfide. The problem was they used pure metal anode 
and had in the end many accidents, so they had to stop doing that. So really the first, it, was, it took Sensi almost 20 years before Sony actually made money out of batteries. So the first yeah. 20 years, people weren't making money. Now, and it was Sony who really using vertical integration, they wanted the battery and everything to the actual device. Yeah. So roughly, let's see, 1973, you, you work on titanium sulfide to have the kind of beta, uh, you know, uh, battery coming out about six, seven years, right? And yeah. then later to the, I think, a largest scale commercialization when Sony came along. That's about close to 20 years. Yeah, yes. that will be the time people should expect. <laughs> yes. Okay. So that, next. Let's just say that's partly why industry is not too happy about investing in batteries. They look at that and say, well, your patent issued in the mid 70s. By the time you're making money, the patent's almost expired. <laughs> that's a challenging uh, for, for the whole field. Yes. Um, Next question, Stan. Um, there is an audience also want you to comment on the solid state batteries, the, the future of solid state batteries. Well, you saw the device we used to measure beta aluminum was totally solid state. I think um, solid state will be safer. I think the big question today is how solid is solid? So the real issue on all solid state battery is the interfaces and if there's any expansion at all, those interfaces are going to crack. So I always, when somebody tells me they've got this great solid state battery, I ask them how many drops of liquid you put on each side. Because you may need something to grease the interfaces. But I think no, solid state is a way to go. It certainly will be much safer than other approaches. But the real challenge is, can you manufacture it as cheaply as you manufacture using today's roll-to-roll -roll technology? Now, I know folks like Applied Materials in Santa Clara, just south of you, are obviously pushing that mm -hmm. avenue, trying to use semiconductor technology. But certainly, I think solid state is the way to go. It's not the panacea everybody thinks it is. Dendrites grow very happily through ceramics maybe even happier than to liquid electrolytes. Yeah, I think there's a lot of young students uh, uh, in the audience. So this will be a good research topic they can, uh, they can work on. Um, there's many exciting problems right there. But if they can solve those problems, uh, the future could be very bright. So uh, good for young students to think about. Okay, Stan, there's also um, a question uh, about um, magnesium batteries, um, organic batteries, this, this person asking, and what's your thought about this? I think overall this person is asking uh, post-lithium ion batteries, and what's the, what, what do you want to bet on? Which one do you want to bet on? I think we often get these questions myself. Right. I think you get this question all the time. Yeah, well, what's your thought of magnesium and organic materials as an electro for the well, batteries? I'm, I'm on the record saying magnesium has no chance whatsoever. And the theorists knew it or should have known it. Um, Anton van der Ven a few years ago did some beautiful calculations and showed, and he used TIS2 as an example, that the voltage for magnesium is one volt less than lithium, not the half volt people thought. And so that immediately cuts the energy density and the magnesium ion is so polarizing it will not move very fast. And about a year after that, Linda Nasor actually built cells, magnesium TIS2 in the two different forms of TIS2. And I don't know, I should say reproduce the theoretical results almost exactly and showed that um, the energy density of the magnesium cells with less than half that of the lithium cells. The interesting thing on magnesium I don't understand is no one has been able to put more than one electron per magnesium into an intercalation host. So I don't know whether there's an inherent issue there, but in my opinion, people should stop trying to sell magnesium batteries. We should understand magnesium. Calcium has almost the same voltage as lithium. So calcium, I think, is much more 
interesting, but people should do fundamental studies looking at no lithium versus sodium versus potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And the, obviously the one material we're talking about gigawatt hour or terawatt hour batteries is to look at sodium because there's more sodium around. Now that it'll be for grid storage, not other things. The other system, obviously, if you want high energy density, we've got to try to make lithium sulfur work, whether it's in a, as I suspect, a solid electrolyte cell, but that's the one with the highest potential energy density. Um, that's good. Uh, so do you want to make comment on organic batteries? Um, organic materials as the electrode? Yeah, they're going to have very low volumetric energy densities. So if you're talking about grid storage or something else like that, that may be viable. We should look at all those things, but emphasize again the science and stop peddling it as the next generation battery, because then we get expectations in Congress that, hey, you've solved all those problems. Why do you need more money? So be, yeah. be very careful. Yeah. So Stan, next question. There's uh, tons of questions flowing in right now. <laughs> I think uh, uh, people are excited about opportunities asking a Nobel laureate, you know, all type of questions. So I, um, I think this question I, I will reserve to, to, you know, at the end when we have a, a kind of panel, short panel discussion with uh, Jun. Uh, this one person asking you prepare for that, you know, uh, how to win Nobel Prize, okay? <laughs> uh, I, I will put on hold on this question. Now, let, let me ask you next one uh, about the uh, more scientific one. Um, it's about anion redox involving cathode. Uh, what's your thought about this? Is it stable if oxygen, right, anion, and the crystalline lattice participate in the redox reaction? and contribute to the cathode capacity. So what's your thought about the anion redox? I, I think that there's a lot of hype and discussion on this. If you go way back when Jean Ruxel at Nantes in France, when he was looking at things like lithium in TIS2 and niobium selenides, he was saying then most of the redox action was on the sulfur. And if you actually look at the expansion of the lattice, lattice expands in the A direction, which says the sulfur is getting larger. So I think we mustn't you know, treat them separately. You've got the covalent lattice and the bonding there is the anion, the redox is on the anion, often as much as on the cation, except in very highly ionic systems. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Stan, next one also we commonly get is uh, about availability of lithium. Yes. Um, you know, people often talk about uh, we might be running out of lithium or easily mine lithium. That's why we start to work on sodium, maybe other uh, cation. Uh, what's your thought about availability of lithium issue right here? That, that was a question that came up in the 1970s. <laughs> and if you look in, at the United States, all the lithium companies, the headquarters are all in North Carolina. Because all the lithium we knew about was mined in North Carolina from hard rock, spotty means, and things like that. All this lithium in South America was discovered much later. So I don't think there's really an availability issue, certainly not for the next 10 or 15 years. There may be an issue of how cheap it is to get the lithium out. And obviously there's always political issues. And it may be the South Americans will say, why don't we make the batteries here? We've got the lithium. We want to make more of the money from the downstream end of things. But I don't think in the near future, and what people say, you know, 20 years from now, we'll be recycling all the old batteries and re reusing that lithium. So electric vehicles, and other home storage, I, there's no issue. But if you're talking about, about gigawatt hours or terawatt hours, grid storage, it then may become an issue. But the one thing people like about lithium ion batteries are they're portable. So even if you look at the large grid storage, they're all in trailers. And the, the one in Binghamton, the company AES found they could make more money in Ohio. So they took the 
batteries to our higher. So the utilities want flexibility. Most of the redox systems, the organic systems, I expect are going to look a bit like chemical plants. They're not mobile, so they have that downside. Yeah, I completely agree with your stand on the availability of lithium. Uh, I don't think that's an issue. It's a cost. Uh, it's not availability issue. Yeah, right. at all. Um, so the next question, Stan, uh, is on this uh, person asking for solid state electrolyte. Uh, which one is closest to application? Is it a Nasicon type, Garnet type, sulfide, or polymer solid electrolyte? So what what? What's your comment on this different type of solid electrolyte? Um, I think the polymer has probably a lead if, it, if, if they can make it stable to a higher cathode potential because it's soft, so it may make a better interface. Um, most of the nasicons and most of the, in fact, the other inorganic ones will react either with the cathode or with the anode. So invariably in those cases, you're probably going to need a a dual electrolyte system, which makes it more complicated. Yeah. But no, the solid polymer is used in these um, Galois cars in Paris and Indianapolis. So it's in use for some specialized applications already. So there's some experience there. It operates at 70 degrees centigrade, which may not be all that good, but in some ways, it's easier to control the temperature if it's a bit above room temperature. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Stan, uh, people also want you to make comment about zinc ion batteries. That's going back to low energy density batteries. So I know there's some facilities in um, CUNY in New York City where they're using it for some smoothing within the engineering building. Uh, obviously, um, zinc air batteries used as primary cells for hearing aids and things like that. And people have made them, you know, partially reversible as an outfit. And I think Phoenix doing that. So th there's challenges there, but they're not going to be high energy density. So you're not going to put them in your phones or in your cars or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And let me give you uh, maybe. Uh, two last quick questions. And the first one is uh, about actual fast charging. So what are the ways for doing a uh, very fast charging? Let's say, you know, five minutes. Well, I would just say probably less than 10 minutes. Like five minutes is very hard, it's less than 15 minutes. Uh, and why are still maintaining the battery's energy density? You know, what, what are the ideas you could do that? I think it's going to be extremely difficult. It's not just you know, retaining its energy density, it's retaining its lifetime. Even if you do tests in the lab, if you overcharge or discharge too fast, you'll degrade the system. So it's going to be a, a trade-off. You know, you, you, I don't think you can have very fast charging and extremely long lifetime. Yeah. Okay, uh, one last question is about uh, a person asking um, the relationship between academia and industry, right? For academia researchers, uh, how do they better transfer the basic study into practical application as scale? That, that's the, the big issue. And I think you may know the answer there <laughs> as well as me. I think the, the problem there, and we're trying to solve it in New York State is, there's really no serious battery manufacturing in the United States. So if you want to transfer your idea from the lab to a product, you invariably these days have to go to Asia and, and get their help in doing it. So certainly we're trying to get the facility built just a few miles from the university to actually get some manufacturing going on in New York State and building a small facility than a full scale facility there. So I think we've got to get some manufacturing going on. And maybe one good thing will come out of this COVID virus is we've got to be more resilient. We've got, got to 
do more than manufacturing ourselves. We can't have the supply chain from all around the world and then it gets broken. Yeah. Well, thank you, Stan. I think in the future we'll have, uh, and also for audience to know, we'll have more of this discussion topic. We will also bring in the industry expert into the future uh, uh, symposium so uh, we can uh, discuss this topic uh, more. Uh, I think the time is uh, up. Stan, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us the, about the history and the prospect of uh, lithium-ion battery. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. and Professor Jin Liu from PNNL National Lab. Uh, Jin, please uh, come back on. Yeah, I'm on. Okay, I will hand the, uh, the podium to you. Thank you, Yi. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yi. Uh, thank you for organizing this great event. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to follow uh, Stan's presentation. Uh, also, uh, some pressure uh, following a wonderful presentation. It's also a great honor to have both Stan and Yi and some of our colleagues from uh, Stanford University SNAC to be on the Battery 500 Consortium team. So Stan today gave a very good presentation on uh, what happened in the field of lithium-ion batteries and some general um, comment on the directions uh, where we need to go in the future. What I'm going to do today is to uh, talk about our effort uh, in developing next generation high energy lithium batteries, particularly from the perspective uh, from the uh, uh, sort of new program DOE, it's not so new now, it's three and a half years. Uh, this program is called the Battery 500 Consortium. So as Stan uh, mentioned, uh, the invention and development of lithium ion batteries uh, really has fundamentally changed the society. Uh, so without this great technology, we will not be doing this uh, uh, video remote conference. Uh, so this is uh, so critical and the Nobel Prize in 2019 was long overdue, in our opinion. One great example of the uh, revolution is the electric vehicles. Um, I think by some estimate uh, uh, in the future, uh, we're probably not going to see every gasoline cars be replaced by electric vehicles. but uh, probably we can comfortably say 20 to 30 percent of the vehicles can be electric. That's a lot because each year we have uh, market about 100 million cars. So uh, really uh, the electric cars uh, not only uh, impact energy environment but also change how we uh, travel. Uh, the, uh, however, if we look at the, uh, what's happening today, uh, the cost of the batteries and some other things still need to be improved. For example, if we look at the Tesla car, I know our friend Yi already on the second Tesla car now. Uh, it's a great car, but the batteries, if you look at uh, right now, the battery costs the pack costs slightly less than $200 per kilowatt hour. If we want to do the calculation, 100 kilowatt hour uh, battery times 200, that's $20,000, right? In cost of batteries. So it's still a little bit more expensive. We want to the reduce the cost to half of that so that not only professors from Stanford University can buy the Teslas. But professors from other universities, students, graduate students, can all buy uh, electric cars uh, at a, uh, the cost of gasoline. So that's a big driving force uh, uh, in the R&D community now. But I don't want to say electric car is the only 
application of lithium batteries. We know our cell phones, personal computers, uh, all heavily rely on this uh, tiny battery uh, in the device on a very small scale. Uh, of course, on the transportation side, we not only have electric cars, we have drones, uh, we're interested in electrified marine transportation, uh, electrified aviation, then the demand for high energy safe batteries goes even much higher. But we're talking about the energy infrastructure, uh, household energy storage, centralized energy storage, the battery get bigger and bigger. As the uh, been discussed, a uh, question being asked, many other technologies have been evaluated. And still, the lithium ion batteries uh, probably are more than 90% of this kind of applications. And what we would like to do in the future really is to improve the technology today so the energy density can be much higher than what we can do today and therefore the cost can be uh, much lower of course without sacrificing the uh, safety and the other properties so if we take lithium ion batteries today slightly under 200 dollars per kilowatt hour if we can do a good job in improving the performance energy density using the right material, we hope to reduce the cost to half of that, less than $100 per kilowatt hour on the cell level. So this is the goal of the Department of Energy. If you look at the cost of lithium ion batteries starting from just not very uh, long ago, we were at almost $1,000 per kilowatt hour. And the cost, as I said, has dropped drastically to less than $200 per kilowatt hour already. But the Department of Energy really would like to drive the cost down to less than $100 per kilowatt hour. And we have done a lot of study. I will show you some schematics on that. We believe the way to do that problem is to go back to the metal anode and then use uh, some uh, good high capacity cathode materials, such as uh, high nickel AMC materials or sulfur cathode. So this is the rationale for this program called the Innovation Center for Battery 500 Consortium. Uh, we are about three and a half year into the program now. Uh, the goal uh, of the program is really to increase energy density, uh, reduce the cost of advanced lithium batteries beyond what we can achieve in today's lithium ion batteries. Um, it's a fairly uh, good sized, uh, big program. In the core program, we have four national labs and five universities. But we only have, we also have Sydney projects. So every about every two years, uh, we open up uh, to uh, teams outside the core team. Uh, they can submit a proposal to DOE, uh, joining as a Sydney project, and then uh, we work on it for about a year or so, uh, narrow down to uh, the next phase, and eventually some of the Sydney projects can be uh, incorporated into the core program. So we started with uh, 10 Sydney projects, uh, 15 Sydney projects. Now uh, in the second phase, we have 10 uh, Sydney projects. In addition to that, we have an uh, industry uh, advisory board, including the three uh, big automobile com companies uh, in the US and Tesla and uh, other uh, uh, non-profit organizations and uh, companies. So the uh, goal of the program is to increase the specific energy of advanced lithium batteries to way beyond what we can do in lithium batteries 
as we said, if we say lithium batteries, uh, we can reasonably shoot for 300 uh, watt, uh, watt hour uh, per kg. And then what we would like to do is to increase that up to 500 uh, with good cycling knife. Uh, what we would like to do really is uh, the program is different from a fundamental research program. So we are not in here trying to invent as many new electrode materials or many new uh, uh, battery chemistry concepts as uh, uh, much as possible. Rather, we rely on the advances made in the community, uh, try to identify the best electrode materials that are already, we believe, uh, scalable and manufacturable in industry. And then we can make this kind of uh, cells without fundamentally change the battery manufacturing infrastructure. So we try to overcome the fundamental scientific barriers to extract the maximum capacity in the electrode material on the cell level. So it's a great emphasis on the, what happens on the cell level, the fundamental uh, mechanisms, fundamental material phenomena can change from single component to the complex cell system level. Uh, so the two systems, as I said, we identified at this time is lithium anode compared, combined with high nickel AMC system or lithium anode with sulfur. That's what we are working on today. Uh, that doesn't mean we are excluding other battery chemistries as they mature. But at this time, uh, we don't think other battery chemistries are mature enough. Let's take, a, for example, lithium air battery. Really, the uh, battery architecture, battery ma electrode material, and the reversibility, all those things are not to the point that we can actually make any reasonable cells to demonstrate how things work, can work together. So we are focusing and take, we're taking at least a very high priority on the AMC system and software system. And since this is organized by uh, Stanford, I just want to show uh, two photos. Uh, the photo on the left one was sort of the first meeting on Battery 500 Consortium. That, uh, that was before we had the program that a few of us, uh, including uh, colleagues from Stanford, uh, Stan, and uh, quite a few people, we all joined the meeting uh, uh, at Stanford in one of the classrooms in East Building. So we kind of dreamed up uh, the program. If we would like to have an integrated battery program in the United States, uh, what do you imagine uh, we should uh, be doing? So uh, this is a photo uh, I took uh, uh, on, the, on the day of the discussion, some of the ideas. Most of the ideas, um, I think, uh, are still holding true today. And the next one, again, is an important event. It's the first quarterly meeting of the Battery 500 Consortium after the White House announced the program. Again, it happened at Stanford Snack, and you see some of the key people attending this meeting. So I want to uh, go through uh, some of the uh, rationales uh, and homework we did uh, together with the Department of Energy, uh, how we come down to this path. Uh, I want to remind you, uh, this chart was uh, uh, derived from a uh, chart uh, initially uh, from Argon and then DOE revised it. And then over the years, I have been revised it. Uh, many of these uh, cycles are for schematic only. It's not drawn exactly pre to precise numbers. But nevertheless, it gave the sort of the ideas on where we can go. So in the sort of the left uh, uh, center of the chart, uh, we show the most of the data 
on the traditional lithium ion batteries in terms of uh, the specific energy, uh, this is a, a graphometric energy density and uh, energy density or volumetric energy density. So uh, we can look at the uh, graphite lithium ion phosphate. Uh, it's a very reliable material, but it has limited uh, energy density in both volume and weight. And then there's a traditional uh, AMC 333 with graphite. But if we take a uh, uh, good AMC material with high nickel content and push it uh, with good anode material, including good graphite and silicon anode, uh, may, we may be able to get to about 300 watt hour per kg in large commercial cells. And then the uh, watt hour energy is also indicated there. And there's a sort of little bit outline of the lithium uh, carbon oxide, as Stan mentioned uh, from uh, the, uh, that's still being used in our cell phones. That chemistry is very unique. Uh, it doesn't have the kind of uh, high graphometric or specific energy as we desire, but it has good volumetric energy density. The size matters. So that's why it's still the dominant chemistry for cell phones and devices like that. However, when we talk about electric cars, we want to do much better in specific energy density. Uh, uh, we did a lot of calculation that two chemistry can potentially do that. One is the AMC, high nickel AMC system with lithium anode. Uh, the other one is lithium sulfur. Lithium sulfur would have, could have much higher specific energy density, but the AMC system may have an advantage in volumetric energy density. So those are the sort of rationales uh, we want to see. Uh, and I also put down uh, other chemistries because people ask about that. The sodium, magnesium, zinc, and the redox, other battery chemistries. These are sort of achievable numbers. So all those are much less than what we can do, even the most basic lithium ion batteries. But there are great value in doing those uh, fundamental study in those systems because uh, they may have application for large scale, very large scale application. And also uh, we may have breakthroughs in the electric material in the future that can fundamentally change the picture. But at this time, I totally agree with Stan that fundamental research in those areas are important, but they cannot be pitched as replacement for lithium ion batteries. Now, this is a slightly outdated uh, calculation of what we can sort of practically do with uh, lithium metal. If we change the materials parameter, uh, what happens to the specific energy? This kind of top-down calculation is very, very important because it essentially tell us exactly what we need to do in each step. So if we start with a traditional lithium ion battery configuration and then replace uh, the uh, graphite anode with uh, lithium metal, in a good cell design, we roughly get 300 watt hour per kg. Now from there is all what we need to push the limit of the material, because when we change the sample parameters, we put a much higher demand on the material, things become much tougher. So the things we need to do is to uh, reduce the amount of the electrolyte, reduce the porosity of the cathode material, increase the cathode loading, increase the cathode thickness, and increase the utilization of the cathode capacity to more than 220 milliamp hour per gram. And we also need to very significantly reduce the amount of inactive materials like 
aluminum, copper, separator, additives, even the package material. So the calculation show that if we really do a good job on all these things, we can get to on the paper, that's the upper limit, right? Close to 500 watt hour uh, per kg. But that doesn't mean we can easily do that in a real cell. Uh, if we want to do that, we need to really carefully consider all the factors that affect not only the materials property, uh, but also cell, cell level energy. Now, if we want to get to really get to 500 watt hour per kg or even higher, we need the invention in new cathode material, or we need to use cathode materials in cathode and uh, in like a sulfur and the other cathode materials. So to make things work under this consortium, we have uh, defined three research thrust, all the way from materials to cell level. But these thrusts are not separate ever. They have to be highly integrated. So the first thrust area is called the materials uh, interface. Uh, and we have a number of scientists uh, in this and Stan is, is the thrust leader for that. But just the material level effort is not enough. That has to be translated to the desired electrode architecture and uh, uh, challenge for this uh, thrust is to really increase the electrode thickness, particularly the cathode, and maximize the materials uh, utilization and, and also include the uh, solid electrolyte membranes to stabilize the niche metal anode. And the last one is a very important one is uh, cell integration fabrication diagnosis. So everything we work on materials and electrode, if it doesn't work on the cell level, then we don't accomplish the goal. So, uh, so this, this is a sort of highly integrated approach that enable us to make real progress. I just want to reiterate what Stan said about the uh, materials uh, utilization. Um, right now in lithium ion batteries, we are up to uh, about 25% of the theoretical capacity we can, uh, of the cathode material we can realize in the real cell. What do we believe if we do everything right under our program using lithium metal anode, we may be able to go up to about 50% utilization of the cathode capacity in a, a full cell system. So if we do that, then even for AM system, that put us uh, above uh, uh, 400 watt hour per kg sort of uh, 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 domain. In the next few slides, I just want to give you some highlights on uh, what we have been accomplishing in the last uh, uh, three years, and then I'll tell you where we are today. So uh, in the first thrust area, the materials uh, interfaces, the example I want to give uh, include one on the cathode material. Stan already talked about this a little bit. In the cathode material, we need to be able to maximize uh, the, or optimize the intrinsic property of the cathode material uh, so that we can use the highest capacity possible of the cathode. So the uh, two areas that limit us uh, on the, just on the material side. One is what Stan talked about is the first cycle loss. There are many reasons for that to happen. The other one is the gradual uh, degradation uh, of the capacity when we have long cycles. So uh, the team uh, made a lot of effort not only in 
developing synthetic effort in making our own cathode material for the AMCs like uh, 622811, but also uh, studying commercially supplied material to understand what causes the first cycle loss or the capacity loss over long cycling. So the uh, lesson we have been learning is that most of these losses uh, could be related to phenomena happening at the electrolyte cathode interfaces. The surface initiated reaction cause uh, internal phase transition, micro uh, cracking, dissolution, and element rich from dissolution from the cathode to the anode. So we believe all this phenomenon can be reduced by proper surface uh, treatment optimization of the surface chemistry. The example uh, shown here is from Stan's group uh, that we can have uh, use niobium oxide coating to prevent the first cycle loss. Another one is from uh, Texas, uh, use inorganic polymer coating uh, to uh, stabilize the non cycling stability of the cathode material. Another very important effort on the materials and interface is the uh, development electrolyte. So one of the sort of key limitation in uh, the cell level chemistry is the reactivity of the lithium metal towards anything, uh, including the electrolyte. So the team, particularly led by uh, scientists at PNO, uh, made a tremendous effort to develop uh, many generations, uh, as I shown here, I'm not going to go through the details, uh, to uh, uh, new bed, uh, electrolyte chemistry, uh, new formulation and improvement of such electrolyte. So the main effort in this are focused on a couple of things. One, increase the columbic efficiency of the electrolyte uh, for lithium metal uh, deposition and uh, stripping. Uh, if we get, want to get a reasonable cycling life, it has to be way more than 99%. Uh, uh, the other one is to improve the voltage window, improve the temperature window, uh, reduce the viscosity and the number of things. As uh, you can see here, uh, this is really uh, an area we made a lot of progress. And some example shown here is that if you have a poor electrolyte, uh, you have uh, deposit lithium metal uh, with very poor structure and uh, more CSEI layer. If you have a good electrolyte, then you really begin to change that uh, in a fundamental way. And you begin to develop a much denser uh, lithium metal uh, uh, deposition layer. Uh, so those are examples from the material level. Uh, going to the next level to the electrode, uh, in order for us, as I said, to increase energy density, we need to increase the uh, cathode thickness from what we do uh, normally uh, 40 micron, 50 micron to uh, or more than 100 micron. Now, uh, this has to be very dense too, right? Uh, we cannot have a lot of porosity, a lot of uh, additives in this. So the additive has to be less than, uh, much less than a few percent. And the porosity needs to be less than 25%. So this is a very difficult. If we do that, even the material level holds up, the uh, uh, electrolyte cannot penetrate the thick electrode, the mechanical property become problem, there's an expansion that all will prevent this uh, good electrode material from working properly in the real cell. So we have done a lot of very detailed characterization, what happens if you have a thick electrode. So if you have a thick electrode, not only uh, you, uh, from the top, of the electrode to the bottom electrode, the chemistry can be different. You only use the electro material at the top, not the uh, uh, bottom. We have in situ X-ray that we can do spatially resolve uh, characterization to prove that. Uh, uh, we also have uneven electrochemical reaction across 
the width of the samples, uh, we show some of the pinholes in this uh, that, that uh, can cause the electrode to fail in a real cell. So we, the team has done a lot of work, try to overcome this kind of problem. A lot of time we think it's just engineering problem, but uh, it's actually a lot of good science into this. Uh, by this time, we showed that even with almost 200 micron thickness on the electrode level, uh, we can still cycle the electrode uh, reasonably. But in real cells, maybe we don't actually need to go to that high thickness. So we are making good progress on that. And another very, very important thing is the fundamental understanding of the failure mechanism in real cells, not just in idealized, uh, uh, not I just idealized uh, situations. Oh, I'm just getting out of, jump, jumping out of myself. But uh, in this case, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, wonderful results from Stanford and uh, UCSD is developing a lot of new tools, particularly in situ uh, characterization tools, and also pioneer work in cry TEM, in the first high resolution uh, TEM characterization of the SEI layer of the dendrite structure. Also the first effort to understand really uh, what happens uh, to the lithium metal, uh, how much is metallic lithium metal failure, how much is really the SEI reaction, uh, those uh, uh, quantification of those is very, very difficult and uh, there have been a lot of effort in our team to characterize that. And the final lesson is that the reaction of the lithium metal cause isolated dead lithium that cause a uh, large part of the cell failure. So let me go back to uh, some uh, important work to prevent the lithium metal from uh, reacting with the electrolyte, not only in terms of better electrolyte, but also in terms of solid electrolyte uh, that can protect the niche metal. There are two approaches we have been uh, following. One is polymer, polymer uh, composite material shown here from Stanford. The other one is a pure ceramic or glassy uh, solid electrolyte uh, from uh, Texas Professor Zhang Goodenough's group. Uh, so uh, this, uh, we, we have not uh, to the point that this have been implemented uh, in the cell, but uh, uh, if uh, we are very hopeful that will happen pretty soon and then that will really uh, be a very significant uh, breakthrough in the field. Now on the cell level, I think uh, people ask uh, the gap between industry and uh, academic research. Uh, so what we have uh, realized is how serious this problem is, because on the cell level, a lot of things are constrained, uh, not uh, free. Uh, and the, for example, just a cycling knife can change drastically depending on the experimental conditions as uh, we've shown here with lithium metal. If you have different amount of electrolyte, different lithium thickness, different cathode thickness, all changes. So you cannot really say, claim how much improvement I have made. So the Battery 500 Consortium really developed a requirement and standard protocols that we need to use when we benchmark our material. If we say this is good, what is good? So we have standard testing conditions that uh, uh, we use to prove that. If we do that, the coin cell results can be a good indicator what, uh, what happens in a real pouch cell. If we don't do that, then there's no collection. And still uh, other things, many other things uh, matters, including safety, how we test the uh, uh, real pouch cells, the effect of pressure, the many, many other things that our team has been making tremendous effort to optimize. But anyway, I think the proof of what we have been doing in the last few years is this one. So 
we have the progress on component, electrode, electrolyte, and niche metal, all the things. Now, we need to put this together to see how it works. So in this chart, we started in 2017 uh, in a real pouch cell. Uh, at that time, we could do 50 cycles. So I would challenge the community today for many of the publications in the literature today. If you take the recipes published uh, in the literature, uh, make a pouch cell, real pouch cell, test them, it probably is going to be less than 100 cycles even today. So after three and a half years, we have made tremendous progress for uh, 350 watt hour PKG cells. Now we can cycle stably way over 350 cycles. So this is the true proof of the strategy we are developing. Uh, we demonstrate that it works. Of course, I don't want to claim that we have solved the problem because the, uh, even we can cycle three to 500 cycles. Uh, we still concern about the safety and many other things that need, still need a fundamental solution. And uh, uh, we can do much higher than uh, 350, but 350 give us a good platform to understand the fundamental phenomena. So here we show the results of 400 watt hour per kg. Another thing I want to show you is that even we do very, the, uh, two, about two amp hour cell, uh, if we make it bigger, 350 become more than 400. And uh, we uh, can optimize it if we replace uh, 622 with 811, increase the thickness, there's still room to improve even on the AMC systems. So uh, this really shows the potential of this approach. Now, people ask, uh, solid state batteries, and I want to just benchmark a little bit. Uh, this is from paper from uh, Germany on um, all the data they dig out for solid batteries. Now, there are many, many fundamental issues in terms of the interfaces and other things. So if you look at this, one thing is it's just not enough to have a solid electrolyte. You need to put them to work in a real cell uh, not only work on the interface, but also get the right configuration. You know, all the, most of the data published, even on the conceptual levels, you can see they are way below what we can achieve with the kind of cell design that we are working on the Battery 500 consortium today. So uh, in summary, I think, uh, for next generation batteries, we are uh, making good progress. Uh, we also believe what we are doing probably, I would claim is the most feasible and promising approach towards something that's better than today's lithium ion batteries. But we are not done. We still have much work to do in solving the lithium metal problem that really requires the integration of material scientists like us, with battery experts like Stan, with engineers, manufacturers, and the whole community need to work together. But just working on material level will not solve the problem. So uh, that's sort of the end of my presentation. I want to end with the same note as Stan ended, that uh, lithium battery has revolutionized how we work and live, and the revolution continues. Uh, the many, many other innovations will come along, and we are in a very, very special period now with the coronavirus. Even under this circumstance, we can think very hard how what we can do can improve how we live our life, how we uh, the quality of work even in a very difficult time. All right, thank you very much. I'll stop here. Well, thank you very much, Jin, uh, for giving a great overview on what's happening in Battery 500 and the key problems um, you would like to address. 
So there, there are a number of questions, again, a very long list from the audience. I will pick some uh, to, to ask you. The first one is uh, uh, about lithium metal uh, anode. This, uh, can do, can, you can have anode free of uh, lithium metal battery, starting from no lithium metal, <laughs> lithium yes. come from cathode. What's your thought about this? Uh, not having lithium foil in there, but having just a current collector to have anode free batteries. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, 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 problem that uh, I think uh, many groups started not just today, but also in the past, even in recent years, PNL published a number of papers and Jeff Dan uh, has published a few papers very recently. And then the Korean group uh, published the, uh, the carbon anode with sort all solid battery design, sort of all solid battery design. Um, so uh, I think uh, it's a, a very uh, important direction, particularly for understanding uh, what happens on both the cathode side and the anode side. In, in, essentially, uh, when we have lithium metal, we have excess lithium in the system that help uh, us to achieve much longer cycling life. But without the lithium metal, if for example, you just have the uh, uh, copper foil in the anode, then uh, what you are doing is essentially you are stripping the uh, lithium from the cathode and deposit uh, on the anode. And then you strip back and forth. Now the stability of the anode is a very significant problem in that case, right? You don't have anything mm -hmm. on the anode problem. But another thing, I really, I have debated with people, uh, I, people should think about. So the anode free only exists at the beginning of this uh, testing. As soon as you begin to sell, uh, uh, cycle the cells, there's no anode free anymore. Because let's say you have a traditional uh, lithium batteries, lithium ion batteries, uh, even the cathode capacity is four millimetre mile uh, per cm square. You essentially have an increment of 20 micron lithium on the uh, cathode, right? If you, in the first charge, discharge cycle, if you move all the lithium from the cathode to the anode. That's what you want to, if you want to use the full capacity of the cathode, right? You move all the lithium, then you get a 20 micron lithium metal on the anode. That's not different than from yeah. the second cycle on, you, then you start with 20 micron lithium, right? So actually, Another free doesn't make the problem go away. It just probably, I think it's an ideal system to study some phenomenon, but it's extremely challenging. Yeah, Jen, I agree with you. I think NO3 should be for a benefit of doing NO3. Uh, uh, at the end, you still have lithium metal coming back to the NO. Right. So, so next question, um, what are the most important steps for lithium sulfur batteries uh, to, to get it to work. We know lithium sulfur is challenging. Both you and I work on this for about <laughs> yeah, yeah. a de decade right now. There's uh, outstanding scientists are out there working on this problem for a long time. So what are the most important steps for lithium sulfur to work? So uh, lithium sulfur is very important. I didn't have a chance to talk about it today. It's still a big uh, effort in our program. And uh, uh, it's a little bit more complicated in the AMC system because in that case, the cathode is also a conversion reaction, right? So for lithium sulfur, because of high capacity of sulfur, we can indeed make uh, high energy cells has been has been reported demonstrated in the literature. Uh, however, the cycling uh, has uh, uh, been much worse than what we can do in the AMC systems. Uh, in that case, I think uh, 
what people have been discussing in the literature, there'll be a lot of effort in trying to understand the dissolution shortening of the polysulfide. And those have been uh, in the literature attributed to the <coughs> main cause of uh, problem of lithium sulfur batteries. But what I really believe the uh, challenge actually should be shifted more to the castle side that uh, what's the ideal castle architecture? Uh, what are the ways to reduce the carbon in the castle, reduce the uh, uh, porosity of the castle uh, while at the same time uh, maintain the stability of the castle? I think people should really uh, uh, spend much more time uh, uh, on the uh, electrode architecture. Yeah. Um, so Jin, uh, there are many questions, you know, ranging from want to ask you, uh, what's the, you know, silicon end now for massive market and, uh, what's the liquid and solid electrolyte comparison where the liquid electrolyte lithium metal can go about 99.8 Coulombic efficiency. I think there's many questions right, uh, right yeah. there. Uh, for the time consideration, why, why don't I, I propose we do this? I think all this question, not only for you, for Stan, it's also for the whole field of uh, battery researchers. Uh, Stan, can, you, can I bring you back up to the, uh, uh, this final? Uh, we have about seven minutes. I think uh, we'll need to end uh, today's uh, symposium. Um, but I do want to take my executive role right here as a, mod, a moder, moderator to ask you some really interesting questions. I meant to ask both of you, uh, I will separate these two uh, questions, one for Jin, one for Stan, right? Uh, Jin, if you don't mind, I come back to Stan. Sure. Uh, Stan, when the Nobel Prize was announced, I was in Germany in the same conference as you. And uh, I was taking the flight back to uh, San Francisco. I predicted, remember, before it was announced, I said, Stan, you are going to win it this year. I told you about, I, I told you about it, and then you won, right? So, and then I thought about this. I think there's a lot of young students in the audience right there. I want to ask you, um, I really like uh, Steve Jobs' uh, you know, um, speech, commencement speech at Stanford 2005, I think. Uh, he, he's saying life is about connecting the dots. There's many things you, you cannot really plan. It's just when you plan that dots right there, you look back, you say they're all connected. So your journey of working on electrochemistry, working on batteries, this uh, long journey right there, what, what's your thought you can share with uh, young students and, and career development? You know, it's, uh, any wisdom you, you can come back and, and share. Can you really predict what's down the road and what is it about your life journey? I think it's difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. But as I said, when I went to <coughs> Exxon, they were very interested in becoming the bell labs of the energy industry. They wanted to make electric vehicles. They perceived that oil was going to run out at some point. So we had this vision of going to electric cars back in the 1970s. And one always has this vision of um, having a big impact and the scientists you like to have a big impact, but you can never predict what's going to happen. And you certainly can't predict what's going to happen with Nobel prizes. It's, it's, you know, we were told in 2015 that John and I were favorites to win it then by Reuters, I think. So both universities talked to each other, planned everything, nothing happened, nothing happened the next year. In 2019, they didn't plan anything. <laughs> so as you, as I, I know I, at least at the, the minute they announced it, you still couldn't predict it, right? The minute before they announced it. <laughs> well, as you know, they, they called me up, I think 30 minutes before the public announcement. Yeah. And they found me in um, Germany at that time. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing. Now, Jun, coming back to you. Um, well, I certainly am very familiar with your career uh, path. Um, about a decade, let's say 15 years ago, Jun, you didn't work on batteries at all, right? You, were, you become known for something else. And then you move into energy storage. 
So what's your thought you can share with uh, students or young faculties, your career path to give them some advice? So, uh, well, this is a very uh, complicated question, but uh, I can sort of uh, talk about two things. One, I think uh, what uh, happened to my career is I uh, know uh, I'm not an expert on a lot of things, uh, including batteries. So you and I started working on batteries about the same time probably. But I think the best thing uh, uh, I did uh, or I tried to do was to learn from the best in the field, really understand uh, uh, what people are thinking about, ask them to teach us uh, uh, the lessons in the uh, research, also the perception and the opinion in battery research. So when we started the, the battery research program, at, PNL at the time we had a zero dollar, zero people, right? We hired a number of people uh, 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 later on and started the program. But one of the best things we did was to invite uh, some of the best experts in batteries, uh, including Stan. He came to Pinyo a few times and we recruited one of his students, Ji Xiao, and uh, many other people. Uh, including yourself, uh, Yi, uh, you have been a great uh, innovator, not only in battery research, uh, but in all other areas. So I learned from all the people around us and then work with the best people uh, in the community. So I think this is probably um, the best effort I made and uh, it has helped uh, not only my career, but it has been helping the community. Another thing I want to share is uh, uh, we really need to understand uh, why we're doing certain things, not only in terms of technology application, but also uh, in terms of science. So uh, uh, it's not just to make ourselves more famous, uh, rich, or more uh, 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 better reputation, not only those, those of if you do good work, those things come along, like Stan, who eventually even much uh, delayed, but uh, received the Nobel Prize, right? You cannot have those things as a goal. But uh, I think my life's lesson is really try to make a difference in people's life, try to uh, make not only myself feel better, make uh, people uh, around us, uh, uh, feel better, uh, do better work, and be able to really communicate on when we are doing certain things. So one of the things I keep on telling our young staff or young scientists is that we need to explain our science or explain our technology to my mother-in-law in five minutes. Uh, if we cannot do that, uh, there may be some problem. Anyway, I'll stop here. I think, uh, Jin, this is a very good concluding remark right there. We are here working on energy storage is try to help solving the world problem. Thank you very much. Well, at the end, uh, Justin, can you bring up the slide? Um, and uh, I would like to just make a concluding uh, remark. First of all, thank you both Stan and Jun for uh, giving uh, just wonderful lectures right here and answering many, many questions. Uh, this will continue into the field. Now this uh, naturally lead to our next week's uh, symposium. Also two very outstanding scientists in the battery field. Uh, Dr. Kel Amin at Argonne National Lab and uh, Professor uh, Peter Bruce from uh, University of Oxford. I please notice the time. It, it will be Friday instead of Thursday, May 29th, the same time, 7 a.m. California time. So it will be, you know, afternoon in Europe and the evening in Asia. Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody and uh, next week's event, uh, this will continue as a weekly online symposium. We try to bring the best speakers 
to interact with the, the whole world, the whole research community. At the end, thank you very much. I'll see you next week.